Hello, I'm Jeff Gadsden, and today we'll be talking about knees and how best to block them for knee replacement surgery. Knee replacement hurts. It's one of the procedures that we use as a benchmark for how well we're doing providing analgesia for patients in general. And we've gone from lengths of stay of four to five days to outpatient knees. And to me, the key pivotal ingredient in how we got from A to B has been the analgesia. And of course, I'm biased, and I think that we should use regional anesthesia whenever possible. And for orthopedics, there's no question that nerve blocks improve a ton of outcomes. We've known this for a long time. Limb surgery is tailor-made for regional anesthesia. And despite this, we have data showing that the use of regional anesthesia for total joints, and by that I mean both peripheral nerve blocks on the left and neuraxial anesthesia on the right, is only 25% at best. Now, granted, this is U.S. data from as far back as 15 years ago, and I hope that we've improved in the last decade, but my suspicion is there's still a big gap. There are reasons for that, and one of those reasons is surgical buy-in. This is what you get when you Google surgical temper tantrum. I think we've all dealt with this at times. I have my suspicions as to why this crops up now and again. It turns out that Google Translate is amazing. One of the languages it knows is surgeon. And so when the surgeon is saying he or she doesn't want to block, what they're really saying is it's about their own priorities and not related to the patient. One of the earliest studies I was involved in when I was a trainee in Toronto was looking at orthopedic surgeons' attitudes towards regional anesthesia. We asked them two questions. The first was, would you recommend regional anesthesia for your patients undergoing a shoulder arthroscopy or an ACL repair? And about a third of them said they would. Then we asked the same group, if you were getting a shoulder scope or an ACL, would you want regional for yourself? And this was the answer, to which I said, I knew it. I think another reason that the proportion of patients receiving peripheral nerve blocks for total knees hasn't been 75, 85, and 95% is that maybe we're doing the wrong blocks for the outcomes we're interested in. And so back when I trained, we were doing a femoral catheter and a sciatic block and sometimes an obturator block. So they had a dead leg and it gets to the idea of pain control versus mobility. Yeah, I can make you really comfortable, but then you're not going to move. And so where do we strike the balance? And then we have falls, which also goes with femoral nerve catheters, although the data there is questionable sometimes, but certainly a femoral block does contribute to quads weakness. And finally, we have this. We're increasingly asking our patients to get out the door. The estimate is that by 2026, which isn't all that far off, over half of all knee replacements in the U.S. will be done on an ambulatory basis. So we need an ambulatory solution. Now, all this sounds good. How do we get these total knee patients walking comfortably? Well, I think part of the answer is to consider the innervation of the knee. Here's a knee from the back on the left, and on the right we have the anterior aspect. The sciatic nerve runs down the back of the thigh and splits into the tibial and common peroneal nerve. And from this rise several genicular nerves that innervate the joint capsule and surrounding tissues. From the peroneal, we have the superior lateral genicular nerve, which winds around to innervate the superior lateral joint capsule. From the tibial portion, we have the superior medial genicular nerve and the inferior medial genicular nerve, both coming around to the front above and below the joint. There are also some nerves on the inferior lateral portion the inferior lateral genicular nerve, and the recurrent peroneal nerve. These are not frequently targets for blockade because of their proximity to the common peroneal and the need to avoid a potential foot drop that would hamper your recovery efforts. Note that there is some disagreement amongst anatomists as to the origin of the superior medial genicular nerve, with some finding it comes off a branch of the femoral. It doesn't matter so much for our practical purposes, we're still going to block it in the same spot. That's a contribution from the sciatic nerve. Then we have branches from the femoral nerve. The saphenous is one, which gives a twig to the medial joint capsule. Then we have an articular branch for each of the three vastus muscles of the quadriceps, nerve to vastus medialis, nerve to vastus intermedius, and nerve to vastus lateralis. So a number of contributions from the femoral. And then in the back of the knee, we have what's called the popliteal plexus, a fine meshwork of small nerves that are derived from both the tibial nerve and the obturator nerve. So there you have it, a dumbed down version of the innervation of the knee. And it took me a while to fully understand this, but knowing this helps us plan. So we can conceive of a set of blocks that takes advantage of that innervation, adductor canal being one of them, and we'll talk about that more in detail. IPAC, which stands for interspace between the popliteal artery and capsule of the knee. And then we have the genicular blocks, which we'll talk about last. And you can see by virtue of the fact that these are all being done in the mid to distal thigh, these are in fact motor sparing nerve blocks. We're not getting the more proximal nerve fibers where the motor branches to quadriceps have yet to come off. 
I liken this to the difference between whole blood and component therapy. We used to transfuse whole blood, which had everything you need, and of course, white cells, which caused a bunch of problems. We learned to spin down and separate just the things we wanted and leave the troublesome bits behind. The whole blood is our set of femoral, sciatic, and obturator blocks, and we've been reconstructing the overall effect of those old blocks by targeting the sensory parts while leaving the motor fibers behind. So let's start with the Dr. Canal. When I first started doing this block a number of years ago, the idea I was working with was that it was a subsartorial saphenous block. In fact, I remember clearly talking to a Danish friend of mine who insisted vehemently that it shouldn't be called the adductor canal block, but rather the subsartorial saphenous block. Don't argue with Vikings, that's my advice. So the saphenous block was being celebrated as a way to get some of the sensory fibers to the knee with no motor weakness, and it was certainly true that compared to femoral, there was virtually 100% motor sparing of the quadriceps in most patients, which was great. Remember though, I had grown up with femoral catheters, so I couldn't quite figure out how a saphenous nerve block could possibly work all that well. I did an inductor canal block on myself one day in the OR, long case, I was bored, and mapped out the distribution. It was, as you might expect, skin on the medial calf. Hmm. What I didn't realize until later is that there was another nerve involved, the nerve to vastus medialis, which runs quite close to the saphenous in the mid-thigh. Turns out that when you look at the anatomic contribution of that nerve to the knee, it's quite substantial, and especially given that it's the medial joint capsule that the orthopedic surgeons are cutting through in their peripatellar arthrotomy, I began to understand why blockade of these two nerves might actually be somewhat useful. Here's the problem though. This is a picture I get not infrequently during a Dr. Canal block. I can see what I assume is the saphenous nerve next to the femoral artery. I don't see many times the nerve to vastus medialis. And if I ought to get that nerve as part of my block, where am I going to put my local anesthetic? I do see a hyperechoic smudge over here. Could be the NVM. I'm not sure. And that leads to a bit of a dilemma in terms of how to go about blocking this deliberately. Complicating that is the fact that anatomically, these two nerves are separated in most patients at mid-thigh by the vasto-adductor membrane. You can see this glistening sheet of fascia separating the two nerves here. You can see that it would be problematic if you're putting all your local just adjacent to the femoral artery, as I've been told to do, because how does it get to the nerve to vastus medialis? And as we began to do more and more of these, we began to get pictures like this after our injection, which show our two nerves. And as you can appreciate, they're in two separate compartments. And we began to think, maybe this is why about a third of my inductor canal blocks are just okay. Some of them are really great, and some of them are fine. Maybe it has to do with the spread of local to the NVM. In this video, you can see the needle coming in from lateral. And as we begin to inject the local, it really begins to brighten up the nerve to vastus medialis with the contrast of the local in the background. Then we advance and click through the vasoadductor membrane. Now you can see the two nerves separately, and most importantly, you can see that they're in two separate compartments. We'll do catheters for this block as well, and here we see that the local is injected through the multi-orifice catheter, and we get local spread in two separate compartments with two separate nerves, again highlighting the fact that putting our local in one compartment may not be good enough. I began to look back at videos we had taken on patients long before I thought of the nerve to vastus medialis. Here's one from six years ago, and you can see the initial injection through the catheter is well medial of the artery, too medial. I want to pull it back so we're getting the saphenous nerve in the lateral side. And what I hadn't even realized then was that I was, fortunately in this case, getting both nerves. There you see it again, two separate compartments. Because we couldn't see the nerve all the time, we thought, okay, we'll use our good friend nerve stimulation and put a hand on the medial vastus muscle by the knee. As a needle gets close to where we think the nerve might lie, all of a sudden we get a twitch isolated to just the medial head of the vastus, and that alerted us to its location. Once the local was deposited, usually it became more clear, and we could proceed to the saphenous. And this has worked for us. It helps to confirm that we're getting local in the right spot, or rather, both right spots. I do believe it makes a difference, too. Since I've been deliberately doing this, the proportion of patients who say their pain is a 5 or 6 out of 10 on the morning of post-up day 1 has decreased. It also confers a safety advantage, and here's why. I've heard of patients that receive an inductor canal block and end up weeks to months later with vastus medialis atrophy. Now, I have no proof for this, but I wonder if part of the problem was that we were not aware that NVM is in the trajectory of the needle path on the way to the artery. And I know that many of my needle passes have undoubtedly skimmed right by, I hope not gone right through, the nerve. But I wonder if in those cases of atrophy, it was because a needle came into contact with the NVM. 
We did a cadaver study at present unpublished, but here's an image from that in which you place needles old school style, as in drive them from lateral to medial with the tip ending up right at the saphenous. We ignored the NVM and then placed wires through those needles, then removed the needles and dissected the thighs. Over half of the wires were either touching or going right through the nerve to vastus medialis, reinforcing the fact that this nerve is in the line of fire. We'll frequently use multi-orifice catheters for this block, bolusing them with 15 to 20 mils, and then running the pump at 8 mils an hour using an intermittent bolus feature. Okay, so are we good? Is that it? Well, you might think so if you read studies like this that compared two groups of patients, one getting femoral block and one getting a ductor canal. They seem to use the same amount of pain meds and have the same degree of relief. But knowing what I know now about the innervation of the knee, I had a hard time reconciling that. We're for sure missing the nerves of vastus intermedius and lateralis, so how could it be the same? In an effort to show that, we took patients who were getting total knees and gave them the usual blocks that we did, a ductor canal with 20 mils of 0.2% ripivacaine and an IPAC with the same dose. All patients got a general anesthetic, and then in the PACU, we asked them their pain score frequently. When they got to a score of 5 or above, they got randomized to a femoral block with either chlorprocaine or saline. We chose chlorprocaine because we were just trying to prove a point, not actually hamper their quads for 18 hours. If the two blocks provided identical pain relief, the pain scores after the femoral block should remain the same in both groups. In fact, they didn't. The group with chlorprocaine got significantly more relief than the saline group, showing, in a model where we use patients as their own controls, that a ductal canal does not equal femoral. Not that we're going to go back to femoral blocks for knees, but hopefully we can stop thinking of adductors as being equal. For the back of the knee, we'll do an IPAC block. Here's a photo and an illustration of the popliteal plexus at the back of the knee. Now there are different ways to anesthetize the popliteal plexus. This is my preferred way. With the curvilinear ultrasound probe on the back of the knee, we'll see the femur, that's the bright white line. We see an artery, and we can see the sciatic nerve branches, although that's not my target. We'll aim to fill up this space between the artery and femur with 20 mils of a dilute solution, usually 0.2% ripivacaine. We can't see the popliteal plexus, the nerves are too small, but it's there. I like to do this in the lateral position after I've done the spinal. I'll tip them over on their side and then come at the back of the knee with a probe like so. Here's a video. So I'll go down and see the condyles of the femur and then slide back up until I see the flat line of the metaphysis. I'll bring the needle in from lateral, although you can do this supine in the frog leg position too, and come in from medial. We'll go all the way across and then as we pull the needle back, we'll deposit our local. And you can see the artery lifting up as we fill up that space and block those fine little nerves of the popliteal plexus. And then to round things off, we have the genicular nerves. Looking back at our scheme of the knee and its innervation, we can see this is one of the last remaining pieces. We've got some of the branches of the femoral nerve, we've got the popliteal plexus, and these branches from the sciatic. These genicular nerves provide easy targets because they run right along the bone in a predictable way. So even if you don't see them, you can put local in the right spot on the bone and get a good effect. We have the superior medial, the superior lateral, and the inferior medial. Remember, we don't target the inferior lateral to avoid getting close to the common peroneal nerve. And while we're putting local close to bone, we can also block the nerve to vastus intermedius, which at this location runs on the anterior surface of the femur. Bonus nerve! The probe is placed on the thigh and calf as such, and the needle is brought in either in plane or out of plane. The goal is to touch the periosteum of the femur or tibia and lift up the overlying tissue. The nerves are too small to see routinely. Sometimes there's a corresponding genicular artery that runs close by that is visible, but not always. Here we see the needle already contacting the femur, the vastus tendon above, and the local lifting up the soft tissue. Easy peasy. There haven't been a lot of studies of this technique as an acute pain theory. It's been something the chronic pain docs do as an ablative technique for arthritic pain, but this is an exploratory study looking at 4 mils of volume at each of the three locations, and you can see that the volume spreads all over the place. So although we're currently using 4 or 5 mils for each, we could probably reduce that volume and still get a very good effect. More work to be done. We had incorporated this block into our block set, and we're seeing good results, but wanted to quantify it rigorously. So we conducted a double-blind trial where we randomized patients to get genicular blocks with either bupivacaine plus dexamethasone or saline. You can see that in the first 24 hours, the treatment group used 60% less opioids than the sham group, and over 48 hours, there was still an effect with 48% less cumulative opioids. So not only are they easy, but they're effective. I sometimes get eye rolls and pushback about the time it takes to do all these blocks. It's a fair point, but I want to show you how little time it takes to do these genicular blocks. 
Here's a video we've sped up, but you can see the time elapsed on the left side. We start with the superior medial, then do the inferior medial, then the superior lateral, and finally the nerve to vastus intermedius. All told, 80 seconds. So given the value they add for opioid sparing, that's time well spent. About 0.3 of a milligram of morphine saved per second. Now, usually in this discussion, someone brings up local infiltration analgesia. And, and look, I'm all for what's best for the patient. But my biggest problem with LIA is the reproducibility and reliability. Orthopedic surgeons are some of my dearest friends, but they're not patient creatures. And I've worked with some great infiltrators who are very practiced and deliberate. And then there's this guy. So he's all set with his 200 mils of cocktail and a sharp needle. The knee is open and he's going to approach the posterior capsule and put the needle through blindly into the space behind it. Now, what's behind that posterior capsule? Yep. Uh-huh. I'm not really sure it's going to do a great job or do it safely, but that little knuckle of fat there, that's going to be so blocked. I'm making a little fun here, but I do have a point. So compared to a set of blocks for which we use ultrasound guidance, are consistently delivered each and every time, and are safe, LIA is not an attractive option. Here's our recipe for total knees, including the multimodal both before and after, a spinal anesthetic, and the three blocks we talked about. In summary, knee innervation is complex with many branches from three separate large nerves. However, it's possible to use our knowledge of that to deconstruct those old school blocks and provide excellent analgesia with little or no motor weakness. Finally, our understanding of the block anatomy of the adductor canal in particular has changed, and that's meant that we need to be more precise and targeted in order to get the best results and to stay safe.